the Cooney Conservation Program's winter webinar series. And this is the third in our four-part series, and we're excited to uh, get going this morning. I thought uh, as we're waiting for people to join, we would do a couple of polls to find out who's out there in the audience. It's always strange to be talking into cyberspace. So uh, the first question is where you're from geographically. So for those of you who joined on, uh, let me know where you're, where you're joining in from. Hopefully that launched. Did that poll launch, Duncan? Oh, there we go. Interesting. A lot of folks from the West Kootenai and equal numbers so far from the East Kootenai and the North Columbia and welcoming participants from other areas of the Kootenai, outside the Kootenais, both within BC and outside BC. So if I close this, this is the first time I've done a poll, I must admit. If I close this, then you should see the results. So this is sharing the poll results. You can see that the majority of folks are from the West Kootenai and uh, other parts of the Kootenays as well. So 90% of us in the Kootenai region. I'll do one more poll as people are joining in. So the next poll is where you're, uh, what perspective you're coming from to learn about wetland restoration and construction. So you can select uh, which perspective you're learning about wetland construction restoration from. Interesting. Got a lot of stewardship groups, almost half the participants. And oh, a quarter of our consultants, 20% students, teachers, and educators. We were only allowed five choices, so I know uh, you might have trouble sort of fitting yourself in here, but we got 94% who voted, so we'll close that poll and share the results with you. So this is uh, where people are coming from, probably a lot of stewardship groups and consultants interested in creating and restoring wetlands, which is wonderful. Hide the poll and go back to the screen. So it's great to know where people are coming from. As I mentioned, this is a third of a four-part webinar series for the winter webinar. So I invite you to enjoy to join our last webinar on March 8th next week with Lynn Campbell from the Ministry of Environment. He'll be speaking to species at risk on private land. You can join that webinar online at kootenyconservation.ca where you signed up for this webinar as well. And I always want to thank our program sponsors and supporters without whom the Kootenai Conservation Program wouldn't uh, sustain itself. So a huge thank you to all of our amazing program sponsors and supporters. The webinar will be about 45 minutes. Neil has a lot to share. He usually does this in four to five hour workshops and we'll have up to 15 minutes for questions at the end. Um, as an audience member, you're on mute and you'll be on mute for the whole presentation. So I encourage you if you have questions or comments to put them into the chat box on your webinar panel and I'll read them out to Neil at the end, or if it's a clarification point, I might uh, read it out during the webinar. 
the webinar will be recorded and made available on our website. So if you've missed the previous two and you'd like to see them, they're there. And if you know folks that would have liked to be on this webinar, uh, let them know it will be recorded. It's usually posted in the next couple of days. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Neil Fletcher, who will hopefully pop onto the screen any moment. Uh, Neil has a broad background in resource management. For the last six years, though, he's focused quite a lot on wetlands. And you may know him because he's offered wetlands institutes, wetland courses, all kinds of things in the Columbia Basin. And we're so lucky that he spends the time to do that. Um, so he'll be speaking to wetland restoration and construction on private land. And uh, I'd like to welcome him and, and pass the open reins to him. Thank you very much, uh, Juliet. I appreciate the introduction. I am going to share my screen now. So um, uh, I just want to check in with Juliet. Is it? Uh, can you see it online? I can see it, and I can see you. Perfect. Okay. So thank you very much, and welcome. Uh, I appreciate being able to present to you today. It was exciting to try to pack so much information into a 45-minute presentation. Uh, so certainly, I hope that you get something out of this presentation, and that, and if not, uh, please uh, uh, bring your questions forward at the end, and then certainly I'll try to answer what I can. Um, if there are any points of clarification throughout, you can always send Juliet uh, a, a quick uh, uh, message and she can ask, uh, she can notify me that there's a question and, and I can certainly clarify a point throughout this presentation as well. Um, so I've been the manager with the Wetlands uh, Education Program for the last uh, almost seven years and I'm also currently the chair of the Wetlands Stewardship Partnership of BC, which is a multi-agency partnership that works on wetland conservation at a provincial level. Um, for those who don't know, um, the BC Wildlife Federation is a, uh, has its roots in fishing and hunting uh, within the province uh, and goes back uh, over 60 years and certainly has been involved in a lot of conservation initiatives throughout that time. There are over 100 member clubs throughout the province as well as over 50,000 members currently, uh, uh, members of the BC Wildlife Federation. The Wetlands Education Program started just over 20 years ago now, uh, and we focus a lot of our effort on doing outreach uh, to various community groups, um, which is uh, more public outreach, as well as targeted education for stewardship groups, consultants, First Nations, government, uh, and then also uh, in the last few years we've been involved in working group workshops, which are looking at watershed level uh, planning uh, with uh, local stakeholders, and um, and those have uh, really helped to prioritize um, regional initiatives. So in this KCP series, as Juliet had mentioned, um, the focus has been on private land and uh, various themes around that. So uh, in earlier on, we had heard from about a landowner contact, and then uh, Nancy Newhouse covered covenants and securements. I'm going to be talking to you today about wetland construction and restoration, and then uh, later we'll hear about species and ecosystem at risk on private land. Um, when I think about our wetlands action plan, which is uh, uh, was developed by the Wetland Stewardship Partnership of BC, the, there are six core goals or core objectives that interrelate uh, and this is how I think about uh, the problem of wetland conservation and uh, various aspects of it. And, and certainly there's, there's an integration of steps that are involved. Uh, and, and certainly this, this goes beyond just uh, wetland conservation but to other types of conservation initiatives. But uh, this is how I like to think of how um, various goals and needs are met. The ultimate goal uh, being uh, some form of on-the-ground restoration or securement, so that would be number five, but certainly there's a lot of enabling aspects of how that would work. 
restoration on private land, I considered one of the tools in the toolbox that can be used. Um, when, when Nancy uh, was talking about, uh, for those who attended that workshop or the, that webinar, uh, she was talking about securement and uh, she had mentioned a couple of things that, that made securement challenging, uh, although very important, uh, some, somewhat challenging. One is that uh, there are more landowners uh, than the capacity of various uh, uh, land trusts to be able to accommodate. So they have limited resources and they need to prioritize sites. So not all landowners um, can secure land um, uh, with the current model that exists. Um, there are also wary landowners, so ones that are not comfortable with um, getting involved in a covenant or um, uh, passing off a parcel of land completely. So uh, these landowners are hard to reach out to. There's also a delay in timing. So let's say there's a parcel that's uh, desirable. Uh, it could be 30, 40, 50 years before that becomes on the market and is accessible uh, for land trusts to, to access. And, and finally, and, and most importantly for me, um, uh, is uh, securement doesn't compensate for losses. So um, there's a lot of proponents who will do securement, so they will purchase a parcel of land to offset damages to another wetland. But that isn't an equal, it, it, it's, not an, it's not a balanced sheet. Um, if you've lost wetlands by securing others, it doesn't mean that you've compensated for them. You're, you're just securing ones that were on the landscape, so we're still at a deficit. So certainly restoration in that context is very important. There are, however, certainly challenges with restoration. There's a lot of information going on on this graph, uh, but uh, this is from a, a study that was published uh, in 2012, and it's a meta-analysis of 621 sites uh, of wetland restoration sites where um, you can see the dashed line is baseline conditions of uh, an un, uh, like a natural wetland. And even over a hundred years in some of these graphs, uh, various functional uh, attributes have not been met to uh, baseline standards. So certainly, um, although restoration c can be important, there are some challenges in being able to uh, approach uh, natural functioning wetlands. Um, but, but that's something I think that, uh, you know, certainly the restoration field is learning how to better, um, uh, better do restoration to, to try to approach that. But there are certainly some challenges with it. Um, if Rob Knight is on. I saw that he was one of the registrants. Uh, this is some work that he had done with the Community Mapping Network, uh, where uh, they had studied um, a number of compensation sites uh, that were required under the Department of Fisheries and Oceans for no net loss of fish habitat uh, along the, uh, the low areas of the Fraser River. Um, in their study, they found that only about 50% of the restoration sites that uh, were established for offsetting um, losses of wetland habitat were performing. So only 50% were performing on two measures, one being that uh, the size had been met and the other being that uh, a good uh, mix of native species were, um, were at the site in comparison to reference sites. So, Certainly there are some huge challenges with restoration, and I'm not going to say that there isn't, uh, but when we look at uh, how many wetlands have been lost, it's, it's certainly important that we consider uh, restoration as one of the tools that we use. Uh, here is a graph of uh, percent of different habitats that have been impacted by the, um, by the reservoirs within the Columbia Basin, and certainly you can see uh, wetlands show up as about a 50% loss uh, of, of, habit, of wetland habitat from uh, just reservoirs alone. Um, so I was just looking at the Duncan Reservoir, for instance, and about 20 or 2,000 hectares of wetlands uh, were flooded uh, within that system. Um, there are other impacts within the 
uh, the Kootenays as well, and I would call the, these other ones more like deaths by a deaths by a thousand cuts. So um, here's an example of a 20 hectare wetland that, in, at the turn of the, the 20th century, uh, was converted into agricultural land. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see a, a series of trees going down the middle of the field. Uh, those are along uh, are, are where a ditch is, and so the this entire uh, uh, wetland uh, was was drained for agricultural purposes. But but, but very very common uh, throughout um, uh, low-lying areas where we like to live. Uh, this is an image of a site that we had done some work on in Salmo, and uh, there was a lot of fill brought into this site. Uh, 40 years ago. Uh, so if you're familiar with Salmo, there's a KP Park. And at KP Park, uh, if you talk to old timers, they will remember fishing in the park uh, where it is where no longer you can fish because it's, it's all been filled in uh, to create a, a different type of amenity for the public. So the the theme of today is about working on private land, and there's a number of reasons why we might want to consider working on, on private land. One is the, the landscape context, and, and Nancy in her presentation said it well. People and wildlife are looking for the same places to live, and, uh, and, and certainly we like to live in the warmer areas where there's access to water, and, and so does wildlife. Um, there are also the historical impacts that have happened on private land. So this is where a lot of draining and filling has occurred. Um, and from a, just a logistical point of view, when we're doing a, 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 a project, there's less stakeholder involvement when you're working on private land, which is, which is actually a nice thing. There's, there's, less, there's fewer people that need to be part of the process on making decisions, so there, there's sort of uh, you're working with the landowner, you're working with the government and, and, and First Nations, but you don't have, um, you certainly don't have all the input from a variety of sources. So it, it, it's slightly easier to work on private land than on public land. Um, now the next, uh, I'd also just wanted to, to pull people, uh, let's see if I can set this poll up, but I wanted to see what your perspective is on should we as a society, should we as a society uh, be paying for restoration on private land? So I'm going to see if I can share that with you here. So the question being, should we be, as a society be paying for restoration on private land? I'm going to just hold that poll up for a second. So certainly, uh, please please fill out the, the poll. I see that 55% of you have voted. OK, so 77% of you have voted. I'm going to close the poll now. And I'm going to show you the results. OK, so 94% of you have said that, uh, yes, society should pay for restoration on private land. 6% uh, of you said no. Certainly, um, the, the, the idea of people saying no is, is not uncommon. Certainly, why should we pay for something that's on private land? Um, but 94% said yes. And, and certainly, um, uh, you know, the landowners have inherited this, this land but might not be able to, to pay for all the restoration needed. There might be a number of reasons why we want the landowner to pay too. Certainly if they've damaged the property, um, that would be a good reason for them to need to repair it. Um, but, let's see. Um, uh, in comparison, actually, your, your, your responses were quite close to a Saskatchewan study uh, where 87% uh, agreed that landowners have an obligation to preserve wetlands on their land, 
and 81% agreed or strongly agreed that society has an obligation to help landowners preserve wetlands on their land. So um, certainly uh, when there's, there's funding opportunities to, to, to intervene or to help and support conservation on private land, it seems to be that there's a, a fairly strong agreement among, uh, among society that, uh, that we should also help to pay for these types of conservation initiatives. Um, when I'm doing work in the, the, the Columbia Basin, one of the guiding documents that has really helped to um, focus uh, some of our priority efforts has been the Riparian and Wetlands Action Plan, um, which has uh, been developed uh, among a number of uh, stakeholders and, and experts that are working on issues around riparian and wetland uh, habitat. Uh, they've identified uh, six priority areas uh, where work uh, needs to be done within the Columbia Basin. And uh, a lot of these uh, sites are, are selected because there are still intact wetlands um, that are fairly, uh, well, they're fairly intact or, or there's an opportunity to do some additional work in those areas for either restoration or securement. Uh, certainly, uh, as a wetlands education program, we've been focusing a lot of our efforts in a number of these priority areas in the last few years, and um, and some of the spin-off effects have indeed been restoration activities. So, if you're a landowner and you um, approach us uh, and ask, you know, how do I get involved in in getting uh, my property looked at and restored, uh, this is roughly the sequence of events that uh, we would go through to take a look at your property. Now, um, I say this from our perspective, but certainly uh, I've noticed there's a number of partners that we've, we've worked with in the past that are on the, on the line and, and may be involved in restoration projects themselves. So certainly uh, this flowchart would look similar for you. Um, and sometimes we enter these stages at different parts of the process. But at, at, at first, we'd have a preliminary screening. So this might be a, a phone call or an email. And, and we'd get a bit, a, we'd inquire a bit about the property and sort of what their objectives are. And from that, we would decide if we wanted to follow through with a, a site visit. And, uh, and, and it might be one or two or an, a number of site visits that might be required uh, to develop uh, a potential design and a budget uh, for the project. At the same time, uh, we'd be looking at um, inquiring with the province about if there are, uh, through an archaeological overview assessment, if there are um, archaeological values that might be tied to the site. Uh, certainly, uh, this would impact the cost of the project going forward, so we'd want to be aware of um, the potential to run into archaeological values. Um, from uh, uh, from this site and the, the budgets that are prepared, uh, we compare these to other projects that we might have uh, identified uh, throughout the province or within, uh, say, the Columbia Basin. And uh, should we decide that it's uh, a worthy project to um, carry forward with, uh, we'd, we'd ask the landowner to sign a stewardship agreement with us. Uh, this stewardship agreement I'll, I'll talk about in a little bit, but certainly uh, for us, it's an important part of the process. Um, from that, uh, we'd go into trying to secure your financial resources, as well as undergoing all the permitting that might be required to work on the site. Um, after this, uh, for our own standard practices, uh, we do a competitive bidding process for physical work. Um, and I mention this because uh, sometimes landowners might have a friend that they want to do the work, uh, but for ourselves, uh, we, we make sure that it's a competitive bid and that we're getting the right uh, personnel and the right price for the, for the project. Uh, and then uh, after that uh, is done, we, we do the restoration work. We will have a, a BC Wildlife Federation appointed uh, site manager who will, take a, uh, who will monitor the site and make sure that our own objectives are being met and that uh, uh, and, and that we're meeting our own standards 
uh, related to the restoration works that are occurring. Uh, and then from that, uh, there's monitoring and adaptive management phases, uh, which would include seeing how the site is functioning both hydrologically and for, from veget a vegetation perspective. And, uh, and if any adjustments are needed, then uh, we would either uh, do those right away or we may need to secure additional financial resources to do that. If, uh, so what kind of sites are we preferring? Which ones would, would we rank as high uh, for ourselves to consider? Uh, first of all, uh, there's, a, there's a, a huge amount of literature around uh, construction versus restoration of sites, and, and certainly um, restoration and enhancement of uh, historic sites uh, where wetlands may have been are preferred over constructing wetlands where wetlands had never been before. Um, we need to demonstrate to ourselves and also to our funders that there is ecological lift at the site, so that means that we're going from a low uh, level of uh, ecological value to high level of ecological values. Um, we do consider the connectivity to the surrounding landscape. So uh, if you're in the middle of an urban environment or a suburban environment uh, where there's little uh, connectivity uh, where, where wildlife can access the site or they it might actually be a, a, a where uh, it'd be a, a place where we'd be attracting amphibians or something to a a site where the population might go into decline, uh, we'd likely avoid those and we'd prefer more rural uh, settings or, or ones that are have a close connection to uh, more natural habitats. Um, we, where we can, we'd like to target species and ecosystems at risk. Uh, certainly uh, these don't always pair up with the available opportunities, but they would rank high on our, on our ranking system uh, where the opportunity does exist. Um, certainly, we're looking for the right landowner, so ones that are willing to allow us to enhance ecological values on their property and who are ready to sign our agreement. Um, certainly, uh, when it comes to this, we do get a lot of uh, landowner inquiries that aren't necessarily a, a aligned with ecological values. It might be that um, they want a fish pond uh, that they or, or they perhaps have damaged their wetland um, and are wanting us to pay for the, the uh, repair of them. And then certainly those types of things uh, we try to avoid and, and, and tell them there's other avenues to, to do that work. Certainly for us, it, it's improving ecological habitat uh, that we're looking for. And um, we want to have a lot of transparency with the, the partnerships or uh, landowners that we're working with. Um, we also consider the cost per ecological outcome. So depending on the project, there could be lots of complications around the soil movement. Um, if a landowner wanted a clay liner wetland where there was no clay on site and we had to bring it in, that probably wouldn't rank very high. Uh, whereas uh, if we're able to uh, restore wetlands in another way, uh, it might be a lot cheaper. We're looking for low risk. And as we're a risk-adverse um, organization. And also, we do, would consider the leveraging of funds or in-kind support that the landowner might be able to bring to the table as well. Uh, in terms of our uh, stewardship agreement, we're pretty happy with uh, how we've developed this. And certainly, we would be willing to share uh, this uh, stewardship agreement template uh, with other organizations if they're interested. Uh, when we first started uh, developing our stewardship agreement, we drew from other organizations within BC. And uh, uh, we, we asked uh, for a lawyer to take, over, take a look at it and uh, point out any gaps that might be in it. And, and certainly, um, she, she overhauled our stewardship agreement and added in some really important elements that um, safeguard ourself, uh, certainly when it comes to uh, doing work on private land. Um, one of the things that, uh, that has really helped us is that uh, she clarified that we do need license to access and to do work on the lands. And then through this agreement, 
the landowner is acknowledging that and contractually allowing us to enter their land. Um, and also um, that the owner is agreeing to be responsible for works after a project completion. So those are two key elements. Um, certainly as, a, as a, an organization, we have limited funding that's tied to grants. So um, we needed the owners to be aware uh, that after we had completed the works, if there were uh, that we are left off the hook to some degree um, uh, for the, those projects. Uh, certainly, we'd be willing to, to you know, do some adaptive management afterwards. But we're really funded. Our, our funding is related to grants, so we would need to uh, reapply if there are any issues. Um, in, in the short term or the midterm. Uh, and another thing is uh, on this page you'll see on the bottom right, um, we, we uh, attach maps uh, for the landowners to take a look at. Um, it, they might be fairly simple as far as where we're hoping to do the wetland work and then where we might be spreading the soil. This seems to be important to many landowners to sort of visualize on their land uh, where um, the extent of the work that we're doing and, and certainly helps to clarify for them uh, what they might expect out of the project. So I had mentioned that uh, restoration is really important to us and and when we're trying to find sites that we can classify as restoration versus construction, um, we're looking for indicators of where wetlands may have been. Um, this is a, a hillshade map uh, and also has an, uh, a layer of where various streams are within um, the Pitt Meadows region. And you can see from this that there's a lot of straight line streams, which are actually ditches uh, within an agricultural area of Pitt Meadows. Uh, whenever you come across a ditch, uh, there, there's often, uh, these are signs that there, ha there is some issue with surface water. People only put ditches in the ground where there are surface water issues, and where there are is typically surface water is where you would have found wetlands before. So finding ditches for us is a good thing. It means that this, these are a good site to, to restore. This is a, a hill shade and a river layer from the Pemberton Valley. Um, if you've ever been to the Pemberton Valley, you might know that uh, they are uh, a leading uh, source of seed potatoes. And uh, what's very interesting about this is that both rivers uh, that are running uh, north-south in this photo have been uh, diverted along the toe of the slope of the mountains. So then the, between those two rivers, agricultural lands could be developed. Um, in natural systems, you wouldn't see rivers uh, running along the toes of the slope like this. So certainly, um, it's most likely that any work between those two rivers could be deemed as a restoration project. Uh, when you're on the ground, uh, certainly you're looking for evidence of, of drainage. Uh, so here we have a ditch running down the middle of a field. Sometimes you'll, you'll come across a project uh, or a site where there's no evidence of, of ditches occurring, but uh, the land is so flat you have to wonder um, if there's something going on at that site. And certainly, uh, uh, tile drainage has, has been used to basically put ditches underground. And, and so in, in many cases, since the early 1800s, uh, uh, farmers have known this, that it, you, can, you can put ditches underground by using uh, uh, tile drains. And so uh, what started as clay tiles has moved to plastics and, and has really made it cheap to uh, carry water below the surface. So this is where you might see this perfectly flat piece of ground. And, and the challenging thing is, is that a lot of landowners aren't aware of that they do have tile, drainage, uh, tile drains on their property. Even uh, uh, if a family member has an inherited a piece of property uh, from from their grandfather. The grandfather may have put those tile drains in, and uh, the 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 kid uh, or you know the grandchildren may not know that that exists still on the property. Uh, 
Um, we were working at a site in uh, uh, on Vancouver Island, and uh, and came across this old uh, style of drainage tile. Uh, this was actually split cedar that had been laid uh, over a meter below the surface of of a field, and was still functioning over a hundred years later. Uh, once we disconnected the uh, the flow of water going through this split cedar, water rose within a day 1.4 meters to the surface. Uh, so these can be very effective at uh, diverting water, but very tricky to find uh, um, uh, without uh, digging various trenches in the ground. Uh, so so certainly. Uh, a lot of projects that might look like construction projects could actually be restoration if you come across tile drains or uh, versions of that. Other things that we're looking for on properties are uh, these are these are called head cuts. So these are where there's many waterfalls that might be occurring along a stream. Uh, lots of streams have been di diverted uh, for parcels of land. Um, we would be looking, if there was a wetland that we were considering, we would be looking for these head cuts either below uh, our wetland area or above the wetland area uh, within the stream system. Uh, and there's a number of reasons we'd be looking for this. If, it, if we found a head cut uh, below stream at a site we were working at, we would have some concern about uh, this head cut moving upward in the stream system as, as the erosive processes are working. It could go right through our wetland unless we barricaded uh, and, and created a hardened surface for that, uh, that drop in elevation to occur. Um, if we detected one of these upstream, we'd want to record that and document it at the site because um, certainly there, once we bring attention to a wetland project, uh, landowners who might be uh, upstream of the system, if, if they de detect one of these head cuts after we've done the work, uh, then they might say that it, it came because of the work that we did at the wetland. So certainly we want to know if these are around. Um, the other thing about if they're upstream is that we might have a lot of, of sedimentation occurring in our wetland project um, if there's these types of um, head cuts occurring uh, upstream. Other impacts we might be looking for uh, are uh, this is uh, impacts to soil or to the vegetation. So uh, here, uh, there's unmanaged uh, cattle access to this wetland. Uh, cattle have uh, compacted the soil as well as uh, denuded it of any vegetation. So certainly, this would be a good candidate for some form of restoration. Um, you can see the difference from left. The left-hand side is a fenced-off part of the wetland, and the right-hand side is where cattle still have access. Um, certainly, simple fencing projects like this can go a long way to uh, reestablishing vegetation at a site. And there's various um, uh, approaches to working uh, with, with sites like that. Uh, this is a cattle access ramp where cattle have uh, access to a small portion of the wetland to go in and get a drink. Uh, but there are, all, are also uh, a number of off-watering uh, uh, opportunities as well to limit uh, cattle access to various wetlands. Uh, invasive species is normally considered a bad thing. It certainly is a bad thing, but from a, if you're looking for a place to do restoration, it's a good thing because then you've potentially found a spot where you can uh, get involved in some restoration work. This is yellow flag iris. Uh, yellow flag, flag iris is a, from Europe. Uh, it was introduced as a garden plant. Um, on the, it has seeds that can float. And on the bottom left, you can see a little seedling uh, that, has, that we scooped off the surface of the water. Uh, that plant could essentially uh, find a new exposed uh, bit of soil around a pond edge and establish itself. Um, once it develops, it can form these massive rhizomes, as you can see on the bottom right. And uh, these can be very challenging to pull out uh, once they've established. Um, here's an image of, 
uh, a site where it was entirely yellow flag iris uh, impacted. And uh, the site was dry enough that we could get a piece of machine in, or a machine to, to come in and scrape off uh, that rise, uh, that layer of rhizome, just like a carpet. And then we ended up burying the, uh, the yellow flag iris on site uh, and were able to convert uh, that area into a shallow open water wetland. So from, from this perspective, the ecological lift was quite high and demonstrable um, uh, because we were working with uh, invasive species that, uh, that uh, totally occupied the site. Another invasive species that we tend to uh, encounter in a number of uh, potential restoration sites is uh, reed canary grass. To me, this is like a, a blank canvas. Uh, certainly, reed canary grass uh, will entirely uh, occupy and dominate uh, wetland habitats. And um, it's considered a disclimactic uh, uh, ecosystem uh, where it gets stuck in, in this, these areas. And certainly, if we come across one of these, these are fairly argumentably uh, fairly good places to do, do work because um, you can't do too much damage. You have a monoculture of one type of plant uh, in an area. So these, these would be uh, suitable sites for doing some form of restoration work more often than, than not. Uh, here's a, a mix of uh, reed canary grass as well as Himalayan blackberry, another great site to do work. The challenge becomes when we're invited to a site uh, where there's a diversity of plants. And then we have to start looking around and saying, hmm, should we be doing work at this site? We've been invited to places like this where there's quite a bit of diversity, a lot of structural diversity, and we've been asked to, to come in and do work. And when I, when I come to a place like this, I have a hard, much harder time uh, thinking that I might be able to demonstrate ecological lift. Uh, so what do we do in this case? Uh, we would we would uh, contract out to a botanist to do a review of the site and let us know what they found. Um, certainly, uh, what we're looking for are indicators of noxious plants or or ones that would indicate that the site is a, in a disturbed state. Um, and we'd get a plant list. Uh, so in this case, uh, we were at the the site you've just seen a photo of. And uh, they gave us a plant list of uh, uh, what was currently occupying the site. And certainly, um, there's a lot of native species and very few weed species or exotic species at that site. So in this case, it would not likely be a good candidate for restoration, only because it was fairly, fairly intact. Um, I did want to mention that uh, the next part I'm going to be talking about a bit are, are uh, a few different techniques for doing wetland restoration. And certainly a lot of uh, my knowledge has, has drawn upon uh, Tom Biebighauser, who, who has built over 2,000 wetlands across North America and has come up to provide training for us for a number of, a number of years. Uh, and uh, his, his, his approach is to create wetlands that will last forever and that require very low maintenance. There are a number of techniques that Tom uh, ha has talked about, uh, certainly for the first part of altering topography and hydrology. These are some of the, the, the techniques that uh, Tom explores uh, when he's giving uh, presentations or sharing his knowledge uh, with us uh, in BC and that we've applied in a number of cases around BC. Uh, so the first is uh, excavating uh, water that perched closely to the surface. So this, these are sites where uh, the water is perhaps just below the surface and we're able to scrape off a bit to expose uh, shallow water uh, wetlands. And in other cases, we, if we have clay around, um, we can create clay liner wetlands. We can compact that clay to hold water on a site. If we don't find clay, and we don't have water near the surface, we're left with uh, the last resort option, which would be to introduce a synthetic liner. And synthetic liners are typically 
uh, where we would be doing uh, more of a construction, uh, constructed wetland. Uh, vertical grade control structures are what we would use to uh, harden uh, areas where there might be those head cuts that you had seen earlier. And then there's also uh, dams, which would be put across uh, streams to hold water back. Uh, Tom, ha Tom has advised, and certainly we've, we've been less, in le less involved in doing dam um, works because of the regulations that are involved in it, uh, as well as the, the need for maintenance on these, prop these sites. Um, and uh, and the risks that are involved. But certainly, um, uh, Ducks Unlimited does have a number of projects in BC where dams have been um, introduced, uh, and, uh, and it is a, a, an approach that should be mentioned. So other enhancements are fencing, uh, and invasive removal, and native plants. So Neil, I'm just are, wanting to note that we're at uh, 47 minutes, just so you know. Okay. Thank you. Um, so uh, there's a couple of things. If you're out of sight, you want a, a flat piece of ground, so you'd be looking at a less than a 4% slope. We'd ask that you dig a hole, and uh, either with a shovel or a soil logger. Um, you're looking for uh, the presence of water at the site. Uh, do I'd certainly ask if you're a private landowner to check the soils. Make sure that you can find uh, clay, the presence of clay at the site. And if you really want to know, bring in a backhoe to, to get uh, more information about your site and to get more certainty around uh, your, your uh, soil profile. Uh, I would be remiss not to mention there are a number of permits that are required uh, from archaeological assessments. The Water Sustainability Act, uh, if you're working around water, you are not exempt. If you are on private land, you will need um, permission to work on water. Water is both surface water and groundwater on private land is still owned by the province and managed by the province. Uh, other considerations might be dam safety regulations, uh, local, there might be local government uh, regulations, so certainly you need to check for those. Uh, and be aware of uh, optimal times to do the work through fish windows and breeding bird windows. Uh, I'm just going to go over one example, and then I'm going to go to uh, questions. So uh, we've been working in the Duncan Lardeau for the last uh, last few years. Uh, we did some design work in, in 2013. We restored some wetlands uh, on uh, Terry and Michelle Halloran's property. Uh, here's a photo from the air. Uh, just next to it was uh, the Nature Trust property. Uh, within a week, we had swans flying in. Uh, the Great Blue Heron, we were using it within the first year. Uh, and here's a photo of the Nature Trust property where we were to, able to build support. Uh, Terry, and Halloran have, Terry and Michelle Halloran have been uh, excellent partners and really uh, raising the flag for, for wetland conservation. Uh, we've been able to get articles in the newspaper as well as host open houses to um, encourage others to do uh, good work around uh, Meadow Creek. Uh, also publishing pamphlets on uh, restoration that target specific uh, regional initiatives. One of the uh, key factors uh, for selling it to other landowners was certainly when you're excavating uh, wetlands, you have a lot of excess soil and that excess soil can be used uh, to raise land and, and uh, create better agricultural land. So these are oats that are growing on Terry's property where no oats had ever grown before. And that was an instigator in getting other landowners to uh, inquire and, and show some interest in benefiting from the project, from having um, some agricultural benefit, as well as, uh, for us, getting some wildlife benefit. Uh, from Terry's site, we had both of his, two of his closest neighbors uh, inquire about uh, doing some work on their property. And this January, January we started two more projects uh, within uh, Meadow Creek. Here's uh, one from January where we were creating a one hectare wetland on Terry's neighbor's property. Um, I'm going to skip over a couple of these uh, due to time. Uh, certainly there's other uh, initiatives that are going on that we've been involved in uh, with, uh, in the Slocan uh, Valley. 
uh, they've been doing some great work around inventory, uh, which has helped to inform uh, what types of wetland restoration projects uh, would best benefit uh, future um, both restoration and co covenant projects. I'm going to skip over those and I will go to this. If you have a project, uh, you are uh, welcome to uh, apply to our Wetlands Institute. It's a seven-day workshop. Please mark your calendars for September 23rd to 29th. Uh, it is free, ex excluding the meals and accommodations, and it's an intensive wetland stewardship training project with hands-on uh, opportunities. Other workshops we have uh, coming up, uh, we have a one-day restoration design workshop in Revelstoke on July 27th with the Columbia Mountain Institute. And I just got word that uh, we will be going ahead with a wetland assessment workshop in the East Kootenays two to three days, but the date is still to be determined. For more information on wetland restoration and construction, uh, you can check out uh, Tom's book, Wetland Restoration Construction, a technical guide. You can find it on Amazon. Uh, this book provides a lot of guidance about specific wetland types in BC, and it's free uh, if you search it online from the Ministry of Forests. Uh, other resources you might consider are the Species and Ecosystem Explorer and the BC Conservation Data Center. And financial grants that will consider private land restoration include the Fish and Wildlife Compensation Program, the National Wetland Conservation Fund, and Wildlife Habitat Canada. So, uh, thank you. Um, and I just wanted to recognize our funders who have helped us with various projects in the Kootenays. Great. Thank you so much, Neil. Obviously, you're a wealth of knowledge, and it's wonderful to have your expertise. We have some time for questions if you want to put them in the uh, chat box and I'll read them out. Um, just while you were noting dates and opportunities, I wanted to mention that the May 2nd spring tour of the Kootenai Conservation Program in the afternoon for the West Kootenai Stewardship Committee will visit Tom Halloran's, or, or, sorry, Terry Halloran's property. And there is also going to be a spring tour in the East Kootenai with the Kootenai Conservation Program on May 11th in that afternoon in the Columbia area. So if you have any questions, pop them in now, and I'll read them out. Um, I'm not seeing any so far coming into our questions box here. Oh, thanks, Neil. Well, well done. A comment Thank for you. And thanks to Neil for promoting the Wetland Restoration and Invasives Workshop on July 27th in Revelstoke. CSIS is hosting the event and CMI is helping promote it. So for more information, visit the CSIS, that's the Columbia Shushwap Invasive Species Society website, ColumbiaShushwapInvasives.org, and uh, go to the Get Involved tab there. Thanks, Robin, for that. Any other questions or comments? And thanks from Robin. Thanks from Richard. I want to thank all of our partners. I see a lot of partners who we've worked with in the past who are on the line, and, and certainly um, we wouldn't be as successful uh, with some of the work we've done without without you. So thank you for all of you who are, who are on the line. You know who you are. <laughs> and some thank yous coming in from various folks here. I think you've covered it quite well. I feel badly for rushing you through when there weren't questions, but we'll just give That's it another okay. minute and see yeah. if anybody else has any. It doesn't look like it. But your uh, phone number and, and email address are there, Neil, so if anybody does have questions, they can contact you uh, directly. And we'll try and get all those dates you mentioned into the Kootenai Conservation Program's e-news so that folks in the Kootenays are aware of them. Great. So, yeah, with that, just a, a huge thank you to you, Neil, for taking the time to do this presentation today. It's been lovely to get to know more about uh, wetland restoration and construction and the importance of wetlands in the Columbia Basin. I know it's a hot topic. It was raised by many partners over the years, and uh, so I'm glad we were able to address it in a short, short time frame today. So with that, thank we'll sign it. off. Thanks to everybody. Thank you.